What's up, everybody? Welcome to Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith. Very special guest in the building. It's Scott Pelly. How are you, sir? I'm well, DJ. Thanks for having me in. You got it. So I've been reading this book, Truth Worth Telling. Your life is a page turner. I got it two days ago. <laughs> I'm 120 pages in. It must have been really awesome for you to put this all to paper. So what was it like just getting it all down there? Oh, it was really interesting. You know, I, I've been a journalist for 45 years. I've been at CBS for 30 years. I've been at 60 Minutes for 20 years. And in doing all of that, you really get a good look around. The one thing I wanted to do, DJ, I wanted to write a memoir, but I wanted to write a memoir that wasn't about me. It's about the people. Because I didn't think anybody would care about <laughs> that. So I wrote a memoir about some of the really amazing people I've met in my life who really discovered the meaning of their lives in some of the really historic events of our time. Yeah, and the one that really struck me was 9-11 because everybody mm. has their story. And your story was crazy because you're, you're running in Central Park, you run down there, the impact of having a pay phone to call back to the newsroom, and then you just dropping to your knees. And all these years later, it, it still sticks with you. And, and I imagine that was a really emotional thing to write out. So what was the toughest part of that for you? I was up on uh, Central Park South when the attack happened. I saw a picture on television of one of the towers burning, and I thought, well, whatever that is, it's going to be a huge story. I was working for 60 Minutes at the time. And so I took a cab as far downtown as I could and then bailed out of the cab when we just got into a crowd of people coming up out of downtown that was too big to get through. And I ran the two miles to the World Trade Center where the buildings were still standing. And I remember in that moment being almost having a feeling of joy because the buildings were still standing. Mm. And I was thinking, okay, people are going to be able to get out of here. And no longer, no sooner than I thought that, than I saw the television mast on One World Trade Center start to go tick tock like a metronome. And I thought, well, that's just got to be a trick of the light, right? It's the, the heat torturing mm. the air. But the b building was losing its will to survive and it began to collapse immediately. And I, what I remember is I fell to my knees and asked God to take all the people that I had just seen perish with no pain. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember getting up. All I remember in the next moment is being in motion, running like hell with a whole bunch of other people, hearing steel hit the street behind me. Uh, and I just ran and ran and ran until I outran the, the cloud of debris and then I turned around and headed back in and, and started my reporting from Ground Zero. So it was an experience that changed my life and the lives of everyone who were down there at the time. What I wanted to do with the book is pay tribute to the firefighters of the FDNY who I watched run into those buildings and go up the stairwells against the chance that they might save somebody's mm. life. 343 firemen were killed. It's the largest loss of life of any emergency service in history. And that chapter of the book is entitled Gallantry. A lot of the chapters in the book are named after virtues. Yeah, I like that. Because I wanted to tell folks about these virtues that are living in Americans today. And you went back and listened to a lot of those recordings, too. So I would imagine that was emotional as well. well what's really interesting about witnessing an event like that, DJ, is that the, the truth is you don't know very much. Yeah. You're an eyewitness to what happened, but... There's so much more. You don't know what happened. Yeah. Really. So with the benefit of hindsight, there are all these engineering reports that took years to, to write that explain why the buildings fell down, how they fell down. It's the first time a steel building had ever collapsed entirely due to fire mm. in the history of the world. Wow. Never happened before. So I didn't understand that at the time. The other thing was there were a lot of recordings, people calling in to 911 from inside the buildings, uh, audio recordings of firefighter traffic on the radios. A lot of that was sealed by the city of New York and was only released years later under court order. And so getting these engineering reports, getting the radio transcripts, getting the 911 call transcripts, I was able to look back on the experience that I had and understand it in a really holistic way. Yeah, we get this complete picture of the day and even your story when you're doing that live shot and 
the emergency officials tell you to move because it's not safe for you and you just move out of the way in time. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that was that, a scary moment when I'm reading. I can't even imagine living through it. That was Seven World Trade Center, which was only 60 stories mm. tall, so nobody remembers right, it, right? It, right. Would be, it would have been the biggest disaster Absolutely. in any city, yeah. except it paled by comparison. Seven World Trade Center was on fire because of all the debris that came crashing out of One and Two World Trade Center. And so it burned furiously all day. And I went down there, I w found some firemen who had just collapsed from exhaustion. And I was interviewing them, and this cop comes running up to us and points at Seven World Trade Center, and he says, this one's coming down, mm. get out of here now. And so I say, what, I say what a reporter always says in a moment like that, sure thing, officer, I'll just be another minute. <laughs> yep. Well, the firemen are used to sensibly following orders, so they get up and they start trudging out. And I look at my watch and it's almost time for us to feed for the evening news. And I think, okay, well, I'll go there too. So I go about two blocks to where we have a live truck set up and there's a producer there who says, we gotta get you on right now, Seven World Trade Center just collapsed. And I said, no, it didn't, mm. I was just there. So I, was there 90, no I was there 90 seconds ago, yeah. it hasn't collapsed. He goes, no, no, it just collapsed. And I said, no, it hasn't collapsed. Listen to me, I was just there. And the engineer in the truck said, look at this. And he reround this videotape and there's Seven World Trade Center and it falls like a house of cards. Mm. If I had just been another minute, like I told the cop, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking with you today. That's crazy. Uh, it fell the minute we got out of the way. Yeah. Unbelievable. So you have stories like that, and then there's other people that come along the way. So let's talk about Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. You spent some time with him, and the boss is somebody that people really love to unpack. What was most interesting about him when you spent time with him? You know, uh, one of my questions to Bruce Springsteen for our 60 Minutes story was, why don't you retire? I mean, you're incredibly wealthy. You don't have to, he was touring, all, right? he was touring with a new album yeah. with, the, with the E Street Band, and he just looked at me like, you know, I'd <laughs> lost my mind. and. What occurred to me in that time and in the time that I spent with Bruce was that he does what he does because he can't stop himself. Mm. It's not about the money, it's not about the fame. He tells me in the interview, in the book, you know, the star thing, I can live without. But he can't live without the music. And he's writing lyrics in his head all the time, even when he's doing something else, all the time. Because that chapter is entitled Authenticity, because it just wells up inside him. He writes music and continues to do so, and just finished that incredible run on Broadway, because he just can't stop himself. Mm. The creativity fountain within him is so great that he just can't do anything else. I'm sure he'll be doing it for many, many more years. Um, we had a really great time together. He's a lovely guy. Yeah. Yeah, and an unbelievably hardworking guy. Oh, man. He told me in the interview, he said, the deal is that for the price of the ticket to the concert, whatever that is, we are supposed to give you something that can't be paid for. And his concerts are famously long. Yeah. Not because the ticket price demands it, but because he doesn't want to stop. <laughs> he doesn't want to quit. It's and really fascinating. It's, it's a wonderful story with him. Even the quote that you use from him to finish that chapter, because you said that was from years ago, it can still be applied to what's going on today, just in terms of the political divisiveness in our world. That's right. And he was talking about what, it, this was in 2007. Yeah. And he said in 2007, we live in a time when what is true can be made to seem a lie and what is a lie can be made to seem true. You're you foreshadowing. And you. I have to remind the audience yeah. in the book, this was 2007, he didn't say this last week. Right. But it was so uh, prescient about the direction the country was headed in. Really amazing, he thinks deeply and a lot about what it means to be an American, who you are, who I am, and what we aspire to as Americans, who are we going to be? And what it means to be patriotic, to Indeed. speak your mind. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So speaking of like 07, 08, you get into your whole story with Ben Bernanke. And that was a situation in which obviously the financial world was in disarray and he was somebody that had never done interviews before. The world was rapidly catching on fire in the Great Recession. I think many people today don't realize what a cataclysm that was because it wasn't 
a sector of the economy like housing or something in particular that collapsed. It was the financial system yeah. that provides the lifeblood for every industry, and it was all around the world. Bernanke believed at the time that we were facing the worst economic crisis in human mm. history, worse than the Great Depression. So here's this guy. He's an economics professor, right? Chairman of the economics department at, yeah. at, at, uh, at Princeton. And he becomes the chair of the Federal Reserve. As the economic crisis is touching off at the end of 2007, Bernanke is widely considered to be the world's foremost expert on the causes of the Great Depression mm. back in 1929. And he sees the same thing happening again. And so he does essentially the opposite of everything the Federal Reserve did back then and just starts flooding the economy with cash. The White House is paralyzed, Capitol Hill is paralyzed, and he takes it upon himself to invoke these emergency powers which have never been invoked since the Great Depression, not even during the Great Depression, but they were created during the Great Depression. And he, in my view, saves the world. Uh, that chapter is entitled Audacity. <laughs> because Fitting. while everyone else was wringing their hands and yeah. gnashing their teeth about what to do, he just opened up the floodgates of money and just poured tons of money like water on a nuclear pile. And one of the things that you alluded to was that the um, chairman of the Federal Reserve did not do interviews. Never, yeah. never sit down for interviews. Because anything they say can be interpreted and send the markets on a roller coaster and all of that. I called the Fed while they were invoking all these emergency authorities. And I talked to the PR guy there and I said, you know, I, I think Ben Bernanke needs to come explain all this on 60 Minutes. The guy laughed out loud. <laughs> I'm holding the phone away from my ear. Laughed out loud and said, the chairman does not do interviews. Mm. But you know, Ben Bernanke had a different sensibility about him. He grew up in a small town in South Carolina. And uh, he thought, you know, the Fed is doing things it's never done before. People don't understand what's happening around them. I need to explain. Since then, all the Fed chairmen have done interviews and had news conferences even, which was never, never happened before, uh, because they feel like the Fed should be more open, transparent, and understandable to the people that it serves. Yeah, really interesting stuff. So let's talk about Walter Cronkite. We were talking about him a little while off camera. He's somebody that was a mentor to you. And listen, this country watched him as Uncle Walter. You assumed the evening news after he had done it. What did you learn from him? And just what type of guy was he to you? Walter taught me uh, three things about writing a news story. Is it right? Is it fair? Is it honest? And I told all of my people at the Evening News that same thing every day when we were putting the broadcast together, to take the newscast down the middle of the road politically and tell everybody's side of every story that we were working on. Walter uh, set that standard for us. It is the standard for us today. And uh, I, I learned a great, great deal from him. Um, I was in Afghanistan during his funeral. I was mm. sorry to have missed his funeral, but I had the sense that Walter figured I was in the right place. Well, it's really interesting you say that because the standard has been set in terms of people traveling around the world and having your boots on the ground, whether it was Walter in Vietnam, whether it was Ed Murrow all the way back in the day overseas. For you personally, why is it so important to go to this site of a situation, whether it's a Sandy Hook, a 9-11 in Afghanistan? Why is that personal to you? The American people have to have reliable first-hand information, particularly from crisis areas, because information is the lifeblood of a democracy in a crisis. So when 9-11 happened, we needed to be right there. When our troops are overseas, I think it's particularly important that we have independent reporters on the battlefield. When America goes to war, all of America has to go. We all have to have skin in this game. And the way that all of America goes is through the independent reporting of the reporter on the battlefield. You know, there's no democracy without journalism. Mm -hmm. 
the founders were counting on us to be proactive citizens. They gave us the power over the government. And so the only way we can fulfill our role as citizens is to have good, reliable information. I was thinking the other day as I was working on the book, what's the best and quickest way to destroy a democracy? Is it terrorism? Is it a great recession? Is it war? I don't think so. Mm. I think the fastest way to destroy a democracy is to poison the information. And that's exactly what we're seeing happening today. The Russians understand that very well. And we need to push back against that as journalists and give the American people what they've had for a long time, which is the best journalism in the world right here. It's one of our best products. And that's something that you've done for decades. And it doesn't matter who it is. You've, you've always pushed back. And even earlier today, I'm watching your interview with then candidate Trump and you pushing back on him. And he's certainly not an easy person to push back on. So how do you prepare for interviews like that? And how do you make sure you get the proper answers out of some of the toughest people to get those answers from? Well, one of the things you have to do is prepare, prepare, prepare. And that's particularly important to President Trump because, and I think even his supporters acknowledge this, he will lie to you mm -hmm. or he will embellish or he will blow things out of proportion. For example, when I did an interview with him during the campaign, he told me 93 million Americans can't get work. Mm. Well, that sounds terrible. And if you go back and do the math, that would be an unemployment rate of 53%. <laughs> right. The unemployment rate as we sat there together was 5%, mm. not little, 53%. Little yeah. So that's what I mean by preparation. You gotta know the facts. So you can push back. You can say, it's not 93 million people. Um, the, the other thing is I always go into an interview with carefully thought out, carefully written questions. I ask the first one and very often never look down at the paper again. Because now, just like you, right. you don't have any paper in front of you. No, I'm just We're listening. We're engaged in a conversation. Yeah. And it's the thing that the interview subject says that maybe you're not expecting, that you're always listening for and, and trying to draw out more information on that. I think the most important skill in interviewing is listening. I agree, definitely. So when people read your book, it's obviously about other people, but we learn about you, whether it's intentional, unintentional. People are gonna find out stories about you, you being on your back in Russia after being taken out there. I mean, Literally that, thrown <laughs> out literally of the Kremlin. It's one of my proudest moments. Yeah, that was something. Uh, I, I was uh, covering the White House at the time as the chief White House correspondent for CBS News. President Clinton was having a summit meeting with Boris Yeltsin. And the press uh, officer who was with us, the American who was with us, said, hey, the Russians have made a particular request that you not interrupt the ceremony. Well, I, we're not gonna interrupt the ceremony. Just ask we, it a question. We never interrupt yeah. a ceremony. We, we let the ceremony play out, and then when it is over, then we start shouting questions <laughs> at the heads of state. But we don't interrupt, ever. So they had the ceremony. Both presidents said something. Uh, and uh, at the end, they turned off the lights, the TV lights, and said, thank you, press, which is, means we're done right. here. The stock market had taken a huge tumble the day before. The president hadn't said anything about it. So I said, Mr. President, the Dow, and that's as far as I got. I had a Secret Service guy, Russian, not American, under each shoulder. They picked me up backwards, <laughs> drug me out of the room. And I thought, okay, well. It's like something out of a movie. Exactly. And I thought, okay, well, that's that. No. Did we go down a corridor? Now we're headed down a staircase, and my heels are going bump, <laughs> bump, bump, bump down the stairs. I'm like, where are we going? <laughs> then we go out. Now we're outside, inside the walled Kremlin. They drag me through this garden backwards, open a door in the Kremlin wall, and literally heave me into Red Square like shot putters on steroids, Unbelievable. I crash onto Red Square on my back and I'm lying there and one of them comes up to me, I got my credentials on a bead chain on my neck, he reaches down, grabs my credentials and snaps them <laughs> off my neck and they go back into the Kremlin wall. And you know, there we were, the two of us lying there, me and Vladimir Lenin. Mm. Uh, lying in his tomb, <laughs> and I thought, I have never been thrown out of a more beautiful place. Crazy story. So yeah. whether it's a story like that or the other ones, what do you want people to learn about you? About me. 
You know, I think of myself at this point in my career as a stepping stone for younger journalists like you uh, to go forward and represent journalism for all of us. The last chapter in the book is called To a Young Journalist, mm -hmm. and it's just my advice on our ethics, on our standards, on what journalism means to the country. James Madison said that freedom of speech is the right that guarantees all the others. This is such a critical thing at this point that, in yeah. history. Um, Madison believed that if we could say what we wanted to say, write what we wanted to write, read what we wanted to read, then all of our other rights would be guaranteed by that, would be protected by that. So when you have a president calling us the enemy of the American people, I, I need an entire legion of young American journalists to step forward and get it right, make sure that it's fair, make sure that it's honest, and show the American people that we can and should and must be trusted. Well, we're ready to run right with you. Thanks Appreciate so much, Scott. You, DJ. Thank you so much. The book is awesome. Enjoy it. All right, everybody. Thank Thanks you. so much. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down. Thank you.